Deputy Director of the Arizona ACLU with us today. And every, we have Alexandra come up here every few years, and every time we come up here, she's got more kids. And she had, she had, she had twins now, so you got five? Oh, no, no, no. I have, I have three only. Three only. All right. Twins. Twins. All right. All right. Well, Alexandra's been coming for years. Uh, she, you, you were originally worked in Florida for the ACLU. And you've been executive director now for what? How long? 2006. She's, she's done just a great job. She does have, as I mentioned earlier, some magazines for the ACLU over there. I'm just going to hand this over to Alexandra. A lot of you know her already. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thanks to the Democrats. Thanks so much to the Democrats and the Red Rocks. I think, um, you know, it, it's been a while since I've been here, and, and he's right, I kind of feel like I was, I was probably very pregnant last time I was here. So, uh, um, you know, thanks so much. It's great to be surrounded by um, friendly faces and, and um, folks who sort of share our values. As Stephen said, I'm the executive director here at the ACLU of Arizona. We are a affiliate of the National ACLU. How many of you are members of the ACLU? Okay, so a, a, a good number of you. Um, as, as, um, as, as members, we're, you know, the, the Arizona affiliate, since I've been here in 2006, has really undergone a tremendous, tremendous growth. Um, and it's really kind of in response to some of the most troubling, problematic public policies that the state of Arizona has managed to pass and implement. And we're sort of the testing ground um, when I got here, it was around immigration issues, but really some of these policies that um, have been very troubling, that have violated people's civil rights and civil liberties, have extended to other areas. I mean, we, we've now become a focal point on issues related to abortion, voting rights. I mean, these are all important issues to many of you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them today. You know, I've been, as Stephen said, I've been with the ACLU, I've been here since 2006, but I've been with the organization for... Um, for about 15 years now. I started in New Orleans and then I worked in Florida. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be part of this organization and to be part of the ACLU at this critical time for, for our nation's democracy. Whether it is standing up and challenging the NSA's massive surveillance program or standing up for young immigrants or taking on the so-called toughest sheriff in America, Joe Arpaio. You know, I, I do feel like... <laughs> We're definitely in the right place, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do feel like that we are always, as the ACLU, on the right side of history. We may not necessarily be on the right side of public opinion um, for, uh, for a lot of the issues that we tackle, but I think ultimately we are standing up for these fundamental, fundamental values of equality and justice for all. So um, I want to talk a little bit, I'm going to kind of start off talking about the, um, the bad and the ugly, and then really end on a more positive note on, on some of the good stuff that we've been working on in a really proactive way. And I'll start off, it seems like every time I get invited here, it's, it's the um, start of the Arizona legislative session, which as you can imagine, there's no shortage of um, really crazy bills <laughs> that are moving to the legislature. So um, one of the things that the ACLU does is we are primarily an organization that engages in litigation, high impact, litigation that affects um, many, many people, and we use litigation as a way to change public policies. And so one of the good things about that is that um, the courts, for the most part throughout our history, have been very, um, they've been really friendly to civil liberties. I mean, we have expanded our rights, um, for the most part throughout our history, through litigation. But I think when you're working and you know, an advocacy organization in the state of Arizona, which is very hostile to civil liberties, when you litigate and when you win, you have to be prepared for backlash. And that's just the reality. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the backlash that we've seen as a result of really positive litigation that the ACLU has been involved in. So um, as you all know, the country has been moving forward on the issue of marriage equality and um, equality for gay um, had a wonderful decision that the ACLU was um, led. The, the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, which meant that now um, gays and lesbians are entitled to federal benefits and they cannot no longer be discriminated against. We then um, have been involved in some litigation, um, specifically in New Mexico. I want to talk a little bit about that. In New Mexico, we represented a gay couple that was um, denied services. The wedding photographer in New Mexico said, well, I'm not going to film your wedding. Um, I'm not going to photograph your wedding. You're gay and lesbian. 
we ultimately ended up um, suing, and the New Mexico Supreme Court said that that violated the state's um, anti-discrimination law. So that case got a lot of publicity nationwide. It was an important decision that really safeguarded and protected the rights of gay and le gays and lesbians to be free from discrimination. The state of Arizona, the Arizona <laughs> legislature, the first bill that will be landing on the governor's desk probably in the next week or so is a bill that allows businesses to discriminate, to do the exact same thing that this wedding photographer did in New Mexico that was struck down as unconstitutional. Now the state of Arizona has allowed businesses to discriminate against gays and lesbians on the basis of their religious beliefs. It's unprecedented legislation. It would be the first state in the country to expand these sort of religious protections for businesses. And um, we're going to be really focusing um, at the, at the, you know, to try to encourage Governor Burr to veto the bill. But I think this is one example of that type of backlash. What we saw, um, in addition, we've been instrumental here at the ACLU of Arizona in fighting and standing up for women's health issues. We were successful in blocking several anti-abortion laws that were passed last um, a couple of years ago at the Arizona legislature. One would, which is the most extreme abortion ban in the country that would have limited abortion after 20 weeks. There were other bills that would have defunded Planned Parenthood, and we, along with our allies at Planned Parenthood, were successful in blocking those, those laws from being implemented. So they never, ever saw the last day. And then, of course, there's more backlash. That um, has resulted, I mean, there's still bills that have been introduced this legislative session, criminalizing adults who help minors obtain abortions, allowing state health department to enter into abortion clinics without warrants, and laws that make it um, more difficult for abortion providers to practice um, without special permission from the hospitals. So they're continuing their attack. And um, the Arizona legislature, um, obviously, those um, it's made up primarily of extremists who've been very, very hostile. So um, another example of the backlash has been in the area of voting rights. I mean, obviously, Arizona um, has made national headlines once again for being a political and social backwater. And in the area of voting rights, we got a great decision in the Supreme Court, it was an ACLU case in the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court said, Arizona, you cannot require additional proof of citizenship requirements for people to register to vote. And the court agreed, and we got a great decision, and then um, the state of Arizona said, well, rather than complying with this decision by the US Supreme Court, what we're gonna do is create a two-tiered dual voting system. A system that means that certain people are going to register and they're going to be eligible for state elections and other people are only going to be, who don't have the minimum the requirements, are only going to be eligible for federal elections. It's a bureaucratic mess. It's going to cost millions of dollars across the state and it's not necessary. And there's a reason why in this country we haven't had dual voting registration systems since the 90s. It's because they disproportionately impact certain groups of voters and they make things more complicated for county elections officials. So that's another area of how the county and the state has really responded um, in a really terrible, terrible way. And we are um, actively looking on, on and trying to figure out how to, how to litigate um, this issue and try to make sure that as many people get the right to vote, as many eligible voters get the right to vote as possible. So um, another area I want to talk a little bit about, I know this is two of the, two of the issues that have been making headlines and really that the ACLU has expanded its focus over the past few years has been obviously um, the immigration the immigration context. And so the ACLU of Arizona has been a leader in really fighting back against many of these anti-immigrant proposals that for, um, for years, I mean in 2010 was when SB 1070 was introduced here in Arizona. It uh, again made Arizona the, um, you know, made national headlines for being one of the most anti-immigrant, intolerant, and bigoted states in the country. <laughs> and, and the reality is that um, the law, the majority of the law, we, went, we, we challenged it, we went to court, and the majority of the law was struck down. But there, the most dangerous provision of the law, which is the show me your papers provision, so to speak, is being aggressively enforced in places like the big metropolitan cities and here as well. Um, it's a provision that allows the police to question people about their immigration status. We have um, received complaints on our hotline. We have a hotline that, that has fielded over 6,000 calls since this provision of the law went into effect last year. Mothers um, are being questioned about their immigration status while walking their kids to school. Students have, are being stopped while riding bikes and asked for their papers. Um, when they don't have ID, obviously you're not going to have identification if you're riding a bicycle. Not everyone carries identification. They have been detained. We've received complaints of students being detained for not having their papers. 
domestic violence survivors who have pending applications um, with the federal government to be here in the United States have been detained. It's a serious, serious problem that is going, um, that is affecting our communities of color and, there's, and, and it is being aggressively, aggressively enforced. And so we are responding and one of the reasons, one of our strategies now is to really look and prove to the court, the case is still being litigated, is to prove to the court the motivations. SB 1070 was passed and was implemented based solely on racial discrimination and um, by the legislature. And so we have, um, this is sort of an interesting side note, we have filed, we've asked as part of this litigation for the court to, to mandate that all of the Arizona <coughs> lawmakers turn over their emails, uh, emails related to the passage of SB 1070. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously caused a huge, huge furor at the Arizona <laughs> legislature. They're not happy with us right now, which is why we've been trying to sort of keep a low profile there. Um, and we, have, we won and we've requested, it was a subpoena, and the, the judge agreed, and now as part of that litigation, they're going to be forced to turn over all of their emails. And the reason for that is we do think, and we are, we do believe very strongly, those emails are going to confirm what we all know, that the motivations for SB 1070 has nothing to do with public safety and everything to do with vilifying and targeting brown people. And so, um, so I, I want to sort of, in the bigger picture context, in terms of the federal government and the federal level, until we have some sort of um, reform on immigration in Congress, these types of abuses are going to continue. Um, we will continue to see people of color being stopped because they're living in the shadows. They are here, they're working, and they've been contributing to our communities for many, many years, um, but they have no legal status. And so, unfortunately, um, things have stalled in Congress. The House is now... Um, sort of mirrored in sort of budget negotiations, and, and they, they have not agreed to move forward a, um, a bill on comprehensive immigration reform. And so we're still, we still don't think it's a lost cause, but we're really, and we're really hoping that um, the House will pass a, um, a similar version, and that we can get some sort of, some sort of legal status for, for these millions of undocumented immigrants, so that they can, so that they can, if they cannot become citizens, which um, ultimately there's some there are differences between the Senate and the House version, and that's a big point of contention, obviously, is whether or not we should grant um, permanent citizenship to people who have been here um, undocumented. And, um, but I think what's important is that at the very minimum, people be given some sort of reprieve and that they be allowed to work here legally um, and not exposing themselves to these types of abuses. So that's sort of the big picture um, on the immigration front. Um, the other big sort of federal issue that I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, which I'm sure all of you have uh, been following very closely, is the issues related to the NSA. Stephen, Stephen asked me to talk about that a little bit. Um, and we were, the um, last year, after we the Snowden revelations that the government had been, for a period of about seven years, collecting American <coughs> phone records, the ACLU filed a lawsuit um, challenging this program. And that, that lawsuit is, is moving forward. It has, um, we've just filed an appeal in that lawsuit. But I think what's, what's important is that we are, we are lobbying Congress for some fixes to this program. And I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the USA Freedom Act, which is um, a big piece of our advocacy in, in Congress. And um, we can go, it's pretty extensive, so I um, want to talk a little bit about the, uh, it's her knocking at the that's me knocking it here. Okay, so, um, <laughs> the, USA, so the USA Freedom Act, which we are supporting, um, currently has 20 co-sponsors in the Senate. Neither McCain and Flake have actually supported the, um, the, the bill, but it's extremely, extremely important because it would end the program of um, collecting these phone records without appropriate court oversight. And I think that's the big piece of it, is that what we have seen through these um, through the surveillance program is that the government has been doing it without the checks and balances that have been so important to our democracy. And so what we are calling for <coughs> in the USA Freedom Act is some sort of judicial oversight. So the government has to go to a court and say, we think that this is um, necessary for the, for the national security, and then the court decides um, whether or not they're going to be um, complying with those court orders. Um, the other big piece of it is that it is the transparency piece. The USA Freedom Act also is calling for increased tra transparency 
by allowing the communications providers to disclose the number of surveillance orders they receive and mandating that the government publish how many people are subject to these surveillance orders. Because I think that was one of the, the, um, the you know, sort of the shocking revelations is that we don't know, when we found out the extent of the program, we never, um, it's difficult to really sort of pinpoint how many people have been um, swept up in this dragnet. And so we know that the major cell phone providers were the ones that were complying with these governmental requests. But it's important <coughs> for people to know who have been targeted um, and, and, and they take appropriate steps to, to make sure that um, their rights are protected. So I think the transparency piece is a big piece of the USA Freedom Act that we are also supporting. Um, the law also creates a public advocate that could advise the secret surveillance court in certain instances. Um, currently, the law has about 134 co-sponsors in the House, including Raul Verhalva, and Republicans, Matt Salmon and David Schweiker. So I think that that's, um, and for those of you who are interested in this issue, I would definitely urge you to um, sign up for our email alerts because our national office is engaging in very aggressive advocacy on this, and we need as much support as we can of our folks calling their members of Congress and encouraging them to vote for the USA Freedom Act. We are not encouraging you all and members of Congress to vote for Senator Feinstein's bill. Bill, and I want to Feinstein's bill, and I want to really clarify that is that um, <coughs> Feinstein has actually introduced a bill called the FISA Improvements Act, which um, is really a dream come true for the NSA and would legalize the government's surveillance program. And so it's not a good step forward, and we're very much um, opposed to it. So the USA Freedom Act is the the um, the bill that we're supporting. So, so those are you know those that's sort of an overview of some of the bigger picture negative um, sort of issues that we're working on defensively. And I think that that's um, you know again in a state like Arizona where you were trying to move the ball forward on a lot of these issues that um, are not necessarily popular with Arizona lawmakers, you spend a lot of time defensively trying to stop these bad measures from going into effect, and we do it through litigation or through the, the targeted lobbying. Um, but I do want it to end on a more positive note, and um, because I think that's really, really important, that um, on the one of the big, big highlights of our, our, of our work over the past few years is was a decision that we got last year from the federal court against our sheriff, Joe Arpaio. And it was a very, very important, it was a historic decision because it was really the first time that a federal court has found that he was engaging in rampant constitutional abuses of people's, rampant abuses of people's constitutional rights. And the judge in this decision that was issued, it was a 54-page decision, um, extensively documented a period of over several years where it was clear that Arpaio was making law enforcement decisions based on nothing more than his um, absolute disdain for um, Latinos. And he was targeting Mexicans um, for no reason other than they were, um, for example, speaking Spanish um, as part of our litigation. We filed this lawsuit in 2008, and so I've been building this case against our pilot for many, many years. The case went to trial in 2012, and it was the first time that we actually, you know, we put him on trial. We had to defend these practices in a public venue, in a public um, setting, and we're able to show through the litigation that um, you know he was his motivations were um, racially were racial motivations that he was deliberately targeting making law enforcement decisions based on nothing more than the fact that maybe somebody was speaking Spanish. The, as part of the, as part of the case, there was um, we uncovered that our our pilot was sort of keeping an immigration file, his own little immigration file, where he would collect all of the letters that he would receive from his supporters. Many of those letters. Where basically they would send him letters and say, "Hey, Arpaio, I was at the McDonald's in Cave Creek, or up in North um, in North Phoenix, and I heard somebody speaking Spanish. I think we should go and conduct a raid there." Um, and, and, it, and it is what is um, what I mean. The, the the unfortunate reality is that we argued that he was making decisions about where to conduct these raids based on nothing more than those than those. Things. And um, the judge ultimately. <coughs> ultimately agreed that he was engaging in um, race discrimination and has, has, now, has, has now, as part of the case, ordered a series of reforms over the next four years that are going to 
basically fix these problems, fix the department, and um, put an end to these discriminatory practices. So I think it's a very, very important <laughs> here in Arizona especially, I don't think we would have ever had the capacity um, eight, ten years ago to take on a case of this magnitude. Um, it's, it, was not a, it was not an easy case, it was an expensive case, but it was an important case to litigate, and it will begin to repair the damage that has been done in Maricopa County um, by Sheriff Arpaio. And you all know, I mean, he's a national figure in this immigration debate. It, Joe Arpaio's practices that were um, these, these same practices that he engaged in in Maricopa County ultimately became the model for SB 1070. And SB 1070, most of it has been struck down. The courts have said that it is unconstitutional, the majority of it. And so here we have this very same practices of Arpaio have been struck down by a federal court now. And I think it really sends an important message to other sheriffs across the country and other states across the country that if you engage in these aggressive anti-immigrant um, enforcement measures, you're going to be held liable and you're going to be forced um, to do the right thing, which is engage in and protect the community and engage in public safety <coughs> rather than targeting people simply based on their skin color. So um, that's an, an important, I want to sort of end on a positive, on a positive note um, because I, I really do think that it's important um, and I think it's, it's, it demonstrates how effective our litigation program has been over the past several years and really stopping some of these discriminatory policies from, from happening. The litigation obviously takes a long time, um, but for, for me, I think it has been very, very personally and professionally rewarding to be part of this organization that has taken on successfully Arpaio. And um, because I'm a, mother, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mother of three kids, I'm also a daughter of immigrants, and so for me, the issue of equality is very, very important. But I think what's also important is that the ACLU is not just standing up for immigrants. I mean, we are standing up for um, all of the targets of discrimination, all of the people, all of the, the women that have been targeted and discriminated against, the gay and lesbians who have been targeted and discriminated against. This is um, an important part of our work, and we're standing up to these um, government measures that have vilified and targeted some of the most vulnerable members of our society. And so um, if you all, and I know that all of you share these values, I would definitely encourage you to become a member of the ACLU and to um, donate to the ACLU. We, we, really, we do not take any government money because we sue the government. So we <laughs> in a slightly difficult position we were then turning around and taking money from the government. So we are sustained simply through the donations of our um, generous supporters, and many of them are here in Sedona and across the state. So I would also urge you to sign up for our, for our emails. You should go to our website at aclauaz.org because that is how we've been engaging our members. That list has grown. There are 20,000 members now. I mean, there are 20,000. We have 20,000 uh, members and supporters on our email action alert list, and so it's a great way to engage in the advocacy. And um, I will be happy to take take questions. Before you take questions, sure. we have something very important for you okay. to do, which we usually trap speakers in. Uh oh. And do the raffles? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. The last three this is numbers. the important part, right? Yes. The last three numbers are six eleven. Six eleven. All right, we have And I do, I do say, oh, I just said, I always win these things. All right, well, you won this one. Congratulations. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it.